There have been jets on standby in the UK every single minute since the Battle of Britain in 1940. All right, y'all, welcome back to Combat Arms Channel. Now, I've been getting this recommendation a bunch, but not really all at once. I think just throughout the entire time I've been making reaction videos, I've been seeing this video pop up every now and again, so I figured we would check it out. Now, this is called Defending Britain, Who Keeps the Country Safe? So I think this is more specifically tailored to highlighting some of those units that people don't know too much about or some, some units that people wouldn't even consider. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of units in the U.S. that, you know, I don't really know about, but, you know, they don't make a video about them, so I'm probably not going to know about them. So it's cool to have videos like this so you can sort of uh, shed some limelight or, you know, shed a, shed a spotlight on some of these units that don't get attention a lot of the time. Now, I don't really know what to expect. That's mainly because I'm not from the United Kingdom or I'm not from Britain, so I don't really know exactly how y'all do the military and civilian life and sort of merge them together because in the u.s they try not to merge the military you know too much we have a few different places where you can see the the military like the tomb of the unknown soldier and things like that but not so much with units protecting civilian assets so i mean i'd be interested to see what we can find out in this video so i guess let's check it out so we might all learn something together every second of every day, they protect us. They are the nearly 200,000 men and women of the UK's armed forces. By land, That's not that much. and air, they keep our islands safe. We go behind the scenes to shed new light on their world and reveal a few surprises along the way. Okay, so already, I didn't know that the military had that few people. Again, the, the nation was a lot smaller than the United States. But yeah, I think in the Marine Corps, the Marine Corps alone, there's like 175,000 people. So the army, of course, is much bigger. But it's interesting to know. Uh, again, now it's not necessarily a bad thing because when you don't have that many people, you can you know spend a little bit less and you know reach out a little bit further. So you can buy better equipment for, for all these people. And at the same time, you can train them a little bit better because you can sort of pay a little bit more attention to them because it's not just like a, a mass machine of producing soldiers as it might look in the United States. In the English Channel, HMS-7 is fighting a war of economics. The Royal Navy polices the fishing industry out here job it's had for 400 years. Wow. The rules are there for a reason, that is to protect the economy of the UK fishing industry and so we have to enforce it if required. If people were allowed to go free reign on our fish stocks and in our waters, they would have no livelihood left. The crew hmm. has a fishing trawler in its sights. <laughs> on board, everything is checked. Nets and fishing gear are first. The holes have to be large enough to let young fish escape. Ah, uh, okay. All right. Nine yeah. seven. All needs to be above eighty. The next stage of the inspection is a check of what's down below in the fish room, and um, we'll be able to estimate the weight of each species. So we'll do that for a couple of species. Just make sure it ties in with what's in the log on board. That wow. We'll checked. Um, if I was a fisherman, I'd be stressing out. If at least a new fisherman, especially if you're not too savvy on all the uh, requirements and everything. If all of a sudden the, the Royal Navy just, you know, strolls along and, and comes onto your ship and all of a sudden they start checking all these these measurements and everything, might be stressing out. But yeah, it's a very good point, especially when you talk about economics, the military sort of has a certain obligation to make sure that the, the nation's economics are in check because they sort of mutually support each other, as you guys can imagine. And uh, again, it's just good for the, uh, the fishing business in general. If you have people who are sort of cheating or, you know, you know, not really listening to the rules, doing their own thing, then they can sort of ruin it for everybody else. So it's it's kind of cool that they have some people to keep them in check. And then we'll just have a general look around. Yeah. Fish caught at sea are packed in ice to keep them fresh. Whatever the weather on deck, it's always freezing down here. <laughs> we'll fish across, so make sure there's no ice or anything else mixed in that will affect the weight. And then we'll just put it straight on the scales. Punishments can be severe. Fines of thousands of pounds, seizure of fish or equipment, or criminal prosecution. It's a necessity. I think you've got to be police. If you break laws and you start landing fish, 
that's not supposed to be landed, you're not doing yourself any favours because it drops the price on the market. He knows what he's talking about. Board, the Navy mover. On Salisbury okay. Plain, the Royal Tank <laughs> Regiment flags. is on the move. In a world of remote piloted drones and laser guided bombs, you might think the tank has had its day, but don't believe it. There is a lot going on at the world at the moment. There are a lot of threats to the United Kingdom, as well as other democracies throughout the world. And in that case, it's entirely possible that the British Army and therefore the Royal Tank Regiment may be called forward. We are part of the reactive force. Our job is to <laughs> ultimately deploy and fight overseas. I just think it's funny how it goes from like policing fishermen to all of a sudden you have like a line of tanks just going across the field. <laughs> I mean, of course, their their capabilities are not going to be matched up. But then again, their responsibilities aren't necessarily matched up as well. And tanks are pretty important. So I know the Marine Corps recently got rid of their tanks and a lot of people weren't too happy with that. But you need to make sure that you can actually maintain them and everything. So if you have like a Royal Tank Regiment, I imagine they're going to have everything possible to make sure that they have you know fully functioning tanks as as much as they can at least and uh, make sure that they get the training they deserve so it's nice to have these specific units that are tailored around one specific thing they train so they are quite literally ready for action these tanks are permanently on okay. standby if a war breaks out in Europe, they could be on the front line in a matter of days. The centerpiece is the Challenger 2 main battle tank. Mm. It's 62 tons and a top speed of nearly 40 miles an hour, it can go where it likes, especially armed as it is with a 120 millimeter gun on the front. Okay. Tanks are essential if we are to provide a potent uh, defense and a capability to combat threats overseas. We're moving roughly from a counterinsurgency focus into being focused again on fighting conventional warfare. True. In that case, in all of the major sort of combat zones in, in the world, so Syria or Iraq or Ukraine, tanks are being used, tanks are fighting tanks. Sometimes only a tank will do. <laughs> That's a good point, I guess. The peer-to-peer -peer fight. Okay. One of the oldest jobs the army does takes place every day right in the heart of London. The Coldstream Guards have been protecting the royal palaces since Charles II was king back in 1660. Dang. Anyone who turns around and says that they don't have, you know, a sort of a, a feeling of pride as they march through the gates of Buckingham Palace, I think is probably lying to you. And, you know, your, your tunic, your bear skin, representing the Coldstream Guards and years and years of tradition, you know, it makes you feel good. This highly polished parade is a long time in the making. Everything has to be just right. There are no shortcuts when you're getting ready to guard the Queen. Yeah, so if you've ever seen the uh, the soldiers in the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier preparing for their post and everything, they do very similar things. Like they're checking everything on their uniform, they're polishing everything, and it looks it needs to look spot on. And that's one of those things, you know, when you have the public eye on you so much, you want to make sure it looks nice and clean, especially when you have such a, a rich tradition to to stand by and follow. Yeah, your belt, you know, you got the, the white the belt, you've got the brass on the belt, you've got more brass, brass, <laughs> brass, and then white in the belt as well. That's probably about half an hour or so. And what about the bear skin? What is that? What's required there? Um, just this hair, really. We just give it a wash every now and again, leave it dry <laughs> upside down, you then comb it upwards and comb it back down just to get it nice and fluffed up, and then again, you wouldn't, you know, wash it once a month. Hmm. To be honest, when it comes on to the boots, you have to put time into your boots. So is there some rivalry in the boots? Uh, yeah, lads. Yeah, <laughs> lads yeah, they always try and have better boots. Oh yeah, my boots are more gleaming. Yeah, it's just the way it is with the guards. Yeah. Yeah, so mm. you got a scratch in your boots there. That's when you've got to go back to the start again, get them sort of redone. You know, you're talking a good few hours' work to get them sorted again. Um, so obviously for, for every guy, it's his pride and joy is his boots. So you just don't don't go near them. Don't touch another guy's. Can appreciate that. 
I know the uh, the U.S. Navy used to be pretty like you know spot on with uh, polishing their boots and everything, but the the U.S. Marine Corps, U.S. Army got rid of those boots a long time ago. So I think the Navy persisted with that, and you can really tell when someone actually pays the uh, the small attention to detail to to really make sure that their their boots are polished up nicely. Then it, it definitely goes to show. At least it goes to show that you care about your your job or at least your uniform. So it definitely does. It definitely does mean a lot, and you can definitely see how it could get competitive in a position like this. Nothing is left to chance. So before the iconic red tunics are put on, it's once round the parade square to make sure everyone knows their job. How does he see? <laughs> So we refer to that parade as the uh, check parade, so it's our sort of final rehearsal. Uh, we like to think that the blokes know what they're doing by the time we get here, but it's just tidying up a few of the sort of, you know, funnies that might, might, might go wrong on the day. So uh, we go through the full mount, uh, at, at sort of periods of the dismount, and then that's us complete, ready to step off in, in tunic and bearskin. Hmm. Then it's time for the finishing touches. And most people, when you think London, you think of guys with big black hats and red tunics outside of Buckingham Palace. So obviously, being a part of that's been you know, a big privilege and get to sort of go places where most sort of civilians don't get to go. <laughs> I wonder if they ever get issued. Half years now and still, you know, the, the Do these guys ever get issued like live ammunition? Because, I don't know, I know like uh, some of the guards and like the embassies and, and everything and even the White House will get Im ammunition sometimes, but I'm not sure if these guys will traditionally go on post with any of that. But, I mean, they do, they do have a bayonet, so I think a lot of it just might be like scare tactics just to make sure that people behave themselves. But if you got, guys could provide some insight, then I'd appreciate it. But I don't really know exactly what their specific role is as far as security Pride of marching across there and having everyone watch you, it still that doesn't change. It's the same the first time I've done it to even now. It's a very proud feeling. Uh, you don't experience it really anywhere else. When you stand there looking smart, you, you think, oh yeah, the public is seeing me looking smart. So it's a good feeling, really. <laughs> but this is just one side of the Coldstream Guards. The other looks like this. Actions on attack, what has happened is... These trainee guardsmen and recent recruits from other regiments are preparing for an ambush at the Catterick garrison in Yorkshire. Sorted mm. to get on with some section attacks, do some fun stuff, running about, um, firing the weapon. Um, so, yeah, look, looking forward to today. The section attacks, fighting. But uh, discharging my weapon, to be honest, I haven't done it yet. <laughs> <laughs> but before you can nice. fire a rifle... It has to be clean. Trigger, trigger guard, pistol grip, magazine housing, magazine release catch. We're just stripping and assembling weapons after contacted last night and this morning, so they're pretty dirty, so you want to clean them just so. And that's where a lot of the attention detail can actually start with just cleaning your weapon. A lot of times people don't really get in the habit of cleaning their weapon too well, and it definitely goes to show when they start having a bunch of malfunction. So me personally, I'm a huge fan of, of cleaning guns. It's sort of like, I don't know, it's like therapeutic for me. It's like it allows me to relax and unwind. But yeah, I mean, I, I take it personally and I take it into consideration. But a lot of people just wouldn't take it the same way because it's just one of those things you expect it to work for you. So you don't swift, anything does happen again, you're not less likely to get stoppages. It makes it less hassle for you. Time then to dig in and wait to attack. This is it, as close as we're going to get to the real thing at the moment. I don't know why you'd ever stand in front of a vehicle like that, but okay. <laughs> Easy day. Mm, okay. Elsewhere in Yorkshire, the bomb squad is training to defuse improvised explosive devices or IEDs. Teams from the Army, RAF and Royal Navy are all being tested. All our scenarios are based upon devices that we've either seen uh, in the past uh, or currently uh, or potentially ones that we think could come in the future. So we try to test them in line with the threat in the UK uh, and also the potential threat from maybe terrorist attacks. Mm. 
That thing is way bigger than a lot of the EOD robots that I've seen. And I, I, that arm especially seems like it serves a very specific purpose. So I'm interested to see what this thing is actually capable of. Where possible, they use the robot. Called a cutlass, it can do it all. Okay. You can open boots, open doors. Um, it's got weapons on it. So you've got certain presets <laughs> that allow it to climb upstairs. Weapons. But sometimes, even the seemingly easy tasks prove tricky. The course is run <laughs> by the Army's Explosive Ordnance Disposal Regiment, or EOD. It's to test the ability to make sure that they seem to be working on the UK mainland streets. One of the toughest hmm. tests for an EOD team is when someone's life is in danger. There's a device under this car. The driver is still inside. No time for the robot or the protective bomb suit. Did so they really like, need like an actual person? So our aim was okay. to get down the road as quick as possible, but safely to assess the situation and try and remove him from the danger, not the danger from him. Once clear, okay. the cutlass is deployed. Makes sense. <laughs> but the job isn't finished, and that means wearing the suit. With all our remote means, everything we do remotely, we have to confirm manually. So whatever the robot does, I didn't have to go and trace because um, sometimes things do get missed on the cameras or mm. we don't see the full device not, might not be separated properly. So then I have to come confirm all that before I can allow anybody else to come down. As you can see, manual dexterity can be quite tricky, especially in these sort of conditions. Uh, obviously rain doesn't help suit the <laughs> itself, uh, especially wearing the Rain never helps. It's very restrictive uh, for breathing. Obviously, it's for my safety. Mentally, it's very fatiguing. Uh, yeah, you're constantly thinking, what am I doing now? But you yeah. enjoy it. Yeah. You definitely need like special people to be able to, to put on that suit and go and do something. I mean, if you get claustrophobic, you probably wouldn't be a fan. And generally, if you are overly cautious, you're probably not going to be on the EOD team. Very much so. As you can see, very happy. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's, uh, it's quite rewarding. Um, you know, it's, it's a very important job. And hopefully we're not needed, but it's, uh, we train very hard in case we are needed. Before a bomb can be diffused, it has to be discovered. That's a cute dog. Often done thanks to the noses of the military working dogs. <laughs> they come in all shapes and sizes. Dang, they got some cute Adrian's dogs there. Search dog Geo. He's a three-year-old golden retriever. Um, he's, an, he's the only golden retriever in, in service in the uh, RAF and the um, British Army. I trust him with my life to, to do the job that I do. Are you friends? <laughs> massively friends, massively friends. He, he loves me, I love him, and uh, we frustrate each other when we're working. <laughs> <laughs> Geo's sense of smell has the power to save lives. He and Rob train hard to make sure that nose is at its best. So this is a um, scent carousel. Um, what I'm doing with Geo mm. is I've put a um, sample that he's trained to find into one of the pots, and he, his job is to go around and um, search in each individual pot in a systematic way, um, and then indicate and tell me where, which part it on. That's cool. Never Geo considered that. Leaves Rob in no doubt where the explosives sure. are. Are you sure? See, come. And that means it's playtime. And this fills up the bond between the dog and the handler. Um, so I can have, as you've seen there, I can have a good, good play with him, chuck him around a bit. And um, it's, it's the interaction between us as well. So he wants to, he wants to keep playing with me. He wants to find, it, find the explosives as, as quick and as, as easily as he can so he can get his ball and have a play with dad. <laughs> that's, that's what really drives him. That's that. a cool job. Really drives him to, uh, to go and go and find that Kong and keeps him going, going, going for so long. <laughs> RAF Bryce Norton has around 40 dogs trained what the for heck? a variety. Dude, every time I see like a military canine, it's like almost always a German Shepherd. But I mean, here I haven't seen like one German Shepherd, but it's pretty cool to have all these different dogs. Again, it's nice to have all these dogs just because they are going to be a little bit better at doing certain things. But I don't know. I always seen like a German Shepherd as a military dog. So. I'm not sure, I don't know anything about dogs or dog species or what one dog is better than the other at, but I mean, it's cool to see just like a variety of dogs just running around. Rolls. <laughs> so, this is Chum, he's a three-year-old uh, collie, and he's trained as a drugs detection dog, working at, uh, mainly out at the terminal here. Hmm. 
So as the, as the bags come through, I'll send Chum onto him and he'll methodically search each, each individual bag. This is all a big game to him, so we associate the scent that he's finding, so the drugs, with the ball, and he wants to work for his ball so he can have that play stage. Hmm. So he's gone back to that bag now, and this is where my interest will help Chum out and we'll work as a team to find anything. And that's Chum's indication there. He's showing me <laughs> that there's something in that bag. They gotta get it off quick or else he's gonna go through the carousel. <laughs> Massive game for him. Massive game. It's the same as all. We're, we're even, even the explosive dogs, they don't realise how much danger they could potentially be and how close they are to, the, to these. Um, to the, you can see he's mad for it. No, we'll go around in a minute, mate. So, yeah, it, it, just, it just replicates into a game and they, they want to chase that ball for as long as they can. That's cool. It's cool to see the other side and see how they actually train and see how they get the dogs in the right mindset. But I didn't think it would... I mean, I guess positive reinforcement is a good thing, but I never actually considered that they actually do it with their, with their dogs as well. Now, I've seen, like, civilian cops go and sweep the, like, the luggage over at airports sometimes, but it's usually not when it's, like, on the carousel. It's, like, before it gets loaded up and everything. But I've never seen, like, the military do it. So I don't know if they have cops that do it as well, that assist, or if these guys are attached to the cops, but... Yeah, I'm sure they stay pretty busy. I'm not sure how much stuff they actually find, though. Hopefully not too much. Each dog has a different personality, but not always a name to match. We've got an Allen at the moment. We've got an Ethel. Uh, we've had a Bubbles. Okay. We had one come in called Killer. Gives you a smile on your face every time you say Allen. This is <laughs> Allen. Sit. Hey! Don't stand still! Ethel's hard, sorry, it's my dog! Jace! Hey, <laughs> come on! Ah! draw weapon, stand still! Alan, <laughs> leave, come in! Alan is a fierce patrol dog, but he's not allowed to bite everyone. When releasing a dog, same with the weapon, when it's endangering life, really is the main thing, um, or key assets, is what we provide. So mm. if somebody has intentions of harming um, persons or equipment, that's when we really can release a dog, yeah. There is plenty That's to cool. protect at RAF Bryce Norton. It's Britain's busiest military airbase. Supplies are flown from here to support operations around the world. The most active okay. of those is Op Shada, the fight against the so-called Islamic State. British jets have been flying sorties since September 2014. So I don't know too much about the Air Force or jets in general, especially the RAF. I know a lot of you guys tell me to do reactions to them, but I just, I can't really provide too much insight because I don't really know exactly what they're doing, why they do certain things, or even what sort of equipment they have. So, I mean, it's nice for them to include them. Of course, when you're talking about keeping the country safe, you're going to want to talk about the people who go out and, you know, sort of bring the fight to the enemy to make sure that they can sort of keep those things under wraps. They've conducted nearly 1,400 airstrikes across Iraq and Syria. Sheesh. Second only to the United States. The British Hell effort yeah. is based at RAF Akrotiri in Cyprus. From there, eight Tornado GR4s and six Typhoons fly their missions. Hmm. There is also a fleet of Reaper drones based in the Gulf. Nice. It's not just about dropping bombs. Crews are also tasked with gathering intelligence. The team on the ground scouring everything that comes in. There's some cool glasses. I wonder what they do. Every time the jets go up, they are joined by Voyager. A military version of the Airbus A330, this refueler <laughs> makes the fight against IS possible. Mm. Pilots can come for a refill up to three times on a sortie, keeping them in the air for seven hours. Other nations' jets also get fuel from Voyager, which allows the combined coalition force to fly missions around the clock. Okay, that's badass. It's a good capability to have. Oh, is this the UN? But this yeah. isn't the only operation on Cyprus. For decades, British soldiers have been helping to keep the peace on the island. They patrol the buffer zone between the Turkish and Greek sides as part of the United Nations operation. Hmm. The 180 kilometer belt of land was finally fenced off in 1974 following a ceasefire. 
It marks the front lines of the Turkish and Greek armies. Troops from 7 Regiment Royal Logistic Corps are currently deployed. They patrol unarmed, checking no one is breaching the terms of the ceasefire. Huh. I mean, <laughs> I mean, okay. I mean, if they are breaking the terms and they can't really do too much about it if they don't have weapons, but I have no idea what this is about. I mean, I'm not really too savvy on the history of like the Mediterranean area and, you know, Turkey. And they're talking about a ceasefire, but it seems like there's still some sort of hostilities because, you know, the UN keeps people there, but I'm not exactly sure. I need to look more into this specific situation, but I don't really know. I don't know how much the US does as far as like the UN, because I don't know any army units or any Marine units that support like the, the UN specifically. In some places, the buffer zone is a few kilometers wide, others just a few meters. Many of the buildings show signs of the fighting. <laughs> yeah, I'd say so. Nothing has really changed here since it stopped. The only new additions, emblems of the different regiments who've patrolled these streets. Hmm. The UN says there are around a thousand incidents a year in the buffer zone, from guns being fired to name calling. The fighting ended 40 years ago, and as yet, no official peace deal has been signed. Wow, that's a lot. Talks continue. Hmm. Did not know that at all. There is a role the British military has been doing for even longer. It happens here, way out on the Yorkshire Moors. This is RAF Filingdale's radar station, where every minute of every day, there is a team looking up on our behalf. Huh. in case there's a nuclear attack. That looks intense. This is the Space Operations Room. This is where we carry out both our primary and secondary mission. Primary being ballistic missile early warning. So essentially, when missiles are launched, we will track them. Uh, the second mission of space surveillance, making sure we know satellites are where they're supposed to be and they're not doing anything they're not supposed to. Throughout the day, we get huh. um, this, uh, what we call a RAF job, which is basically uh, like a bus timetable for satellites. Um, so these are the objects that we're interested in. What I've put up here is a... Uh, That's really cool. ...the orbit for the International Space Station. Uh, it comes up as Object 25544. The ISS is obviously a, a huge object, so, so if, if we miss that object, um, <laughs> we've done something very wrong. But yeah. So that's really cool. Like I'm a huge fan of like space stuff and, and everything like that. So being able to track all these different satellites sounds like a really interesting job. Now I'm not exactly sure. It seems like this is like the RAF doing this. That sounds like a really dope job. I mean, it sounds like it could get very monotonous, but I don't know, just seeing, just being more connected to the stuff that's out in space just sounds kind of cool. Um, the, the smaller objects are the ones that we're, we have a bit more interest in. They're tracking around 40,000 objects in space. Only about 2,000 are working satellites. So they are looking out for potential collisions, but also where mm. new satellites could go. The ballistic missile threat kind of captures the public imagination because most people live through it through the Cold War and they understand what it means. I, I think trying to explain to people that denial of space would take away some of their basic things they've come used to these days, no Facebook, no social media, <laughs> probably has a bigger impact, but they probably just don't really connect it with what's happening in space. But the primary mission remains providing early warning of mm. a nuclear strike. They train hard and often, so they're ready. Okay, See what their training one. looks like. Don't tell us what's happening here. At the moment, the uh, satellites picked up a large heat source from a, a missile launch or a space launch. They're preparing now just in case it generates a, a site report, which is a, a launch predicted impact for a missile. And the guys at the front, they're talking to UK and, and uh, American higher authority okay. to make sure they're receiving Filingdale's data. Mm. Filingdale's site report result are valid for two missiles. Acknowledge CTF-345. Acknowledge UK Spock. So that'll be the, uh, the launch point and the predicted impact point and the times the missile is expected to impact on the ground. Wow. So you can imagine they have some pretty solid equipment to be able to track all of that. I'm not really sure. I wonder if they can track like the, the point of origin to see where it came from. If they can track the, the trajectory and where it's going to be landing, I can imagine that they can track the point of origin. But yeah, I mean, that's a that sounds like a really cool job. And it seems like they definitely work with a lot of different people and even different countries. And I'm, I'm sure they work with like other like three letter agencies in the US if they're sort of doing this, this sort of cross training. But again, this is one of those jobs that you would, you would not expect, you would not think about whatsoever until you actually 
you know, can you can you can actually see the importance of it. And of course, their job seems very important. East one two two decimal zero two, earliest time zero nine three six five one. Those computers historically. Those computers look super old, though. <laughs> I don't know. Th this video is a couple years old, but those computers look like they're from like the the late nineties or something. But I guess that's just military hardware. It doesn't really have to look that great, I guess. The threat came from Soviet Russia and elsewhere. Okay. Once again, it is the Russians keeping our armed forces busy. <laughs> Russian planes repeatedly buzz NATO airspace. A yeah. modern threat the RAF is ready for. There have been jets on standby in the UK every single minute since the Battle of Britain in 1940. Mm. That's badass. This training exercise shows how quickly they react. When it really hits home, you can imagine they're going to take it seriously. In minutes, they are alongside a private jet which is off its flight plan. If this were real and the jet refused to divert, the Typhoon pilot could be ordered to shoot it down. Dang. Makes sense, but sucks for the Back pilot. In the English Channel, it is the Russians once again demanding attention. HMS-7 drops its role as fishery protection to help. We were tasked by uh, the Navy to intercept a Russian landing craft or a landing ship uh, that was uh, returning uh, from the Mediterranean and heading back, uh, we believe, uh, towards its home port in Russia. We sighted it at about 12 miles and we closed in and uh, put the ship uh, just astern, so behind the Russian ship, had about a mile uh, to follow her up the English Channel. Hmm. The Royal Navy regularly conducts escort duties as part of our responsibility to protect UK waters. <laughs> At the I like how they call it escort. They're just trying to make sure that they keep the pressure on them and make sure that they're not doing anything crazy. But that seems like a cool job. It seems like he takes it pretty serious, but at the same time, he's not too worried about it because I'm sure he sees this a bunch. At the end uh, of, the, uh, of the encounter with her, uh, we have a tradition that uh, warships salute each other. That's cool. And so when we departed the escort, uh, we conducted a sail past of the of the Russian ship, and we also hoisted an international signal code, uh, code Uniform Whiskey, which which wishes them a safe onward voyage. But the Russians sailed on without responding. <laughs> That's rude. I mean, there's definitely a certain thing with the uh, the U.S. Navy, or not not really the U.S. Navy, with all navies in general, how they have like this mutual respect for each other. I know when, I think, I don't know when it was, but there was like a, a disaster with a Russian submarine. I think it caught on fire and a lot of the sailors actually ended up dying. But there's like a mutual respect and understanding for, you know, how crappy that can actually be. So it's, I don't know, it's a weird thing. You'd, you'd have to be in the Navy or be around the Navy to sort of understand that mutual respect. So it's kind of messed up for them to not to, to not return that, that favor and everything. So this is a cool video. Again, it, it really gives you like insights to things you wouldn't even consider. And again, I'm sure there's a bunch of crazy stuff in the US that I'm not really savvy on, but I'm sure there's a lot of other crazy stuff in the UK and throughout the world that, you know, they try and keep it a little bit more under wraps. So they, they gave us a little bit of a spotlight for some of those units that you don't really hear about. But I mean, it's cool. It gives you a, a good insight to everything that's going on behind the scenes, things that you wouldn't really appreciate unless you saw it in a video like this. And of course, Forces TV does an awesome production. So it's cool to see all these different all these different units and see how they actually do things and how they actually train and what their actual purpose is. Because if we didn't really see their purpose or their training, then the public might not understand it still. So this is a cool recommendation and I'm glad they made this video because it really gives you that, uh, that appreciation for some of those smaller jobs. But yeah, let me know what you guys think about this. If you learned something, then uh, throw that in the comments section. If there's anything else that this video didn't really highlight and you guys just want to throw that in the comments section as well, you know, from any country. I know Finland has like a bunch of underground stuff and I'm about to check out a video about that. But there's a bunch of other crazy stuff going on throughout these other countries that people don't really know about. But they definitely serve their purpose. And it's cool to get a little bit of a, a highlight or insight into all of this. And of course, it's always cool to check out these things that I wouldn't be thinking about checking out anyway. So let me know what you guys think in the comment section. I do appreciate you guys watching the video. 
But that is it for this one. So I will see you all in the next one.